Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. We'll start out. We'll start off tonight as uh, usual with our Pledge of Allegiance and then followed by the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Dr. Schaefer, do we have any amendments to the agenda this evening? Uh, yes, I do have an amendment to request this evening. Uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, add under new business item 5I, it's actually we, we took the liberty of going ahead and including that on there, um, consideration of adult meal prices. Um, that way we can make a correction in those from a previous meeting because the <laughs> the, the uh, Government changed the change the prices on that from the information we had earlier, so that was not included on the original agenda. So we'd like to have the board approved to add and amend the agenda for that item, please. Any other amendments? Um, yes, under old business. I would like to discuss the um, volunteer protocols in regards to vaccinations, please. And I, I think as far as our record keeping, we'll just refer that to item A uh, under old business would be appropriate. Okay. Are there any more amendments? Okay, thank you for those. And we do we have a motion to accept the amendments as presented? So moved. Mrs. Ward, a second. Second. Mr. Hemsel, any discussion? Very well. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Carries unanimously. Thank you. Moving along to reports to the board. Uh, review of the school reentry plan, Dr. Schaefer. Oh, I'm too far along. I am wanting to rush through this meeting tonight. <laughs> uh, let's go with the meeting minutes, approval of July 7th, 2021 public work session minutes. Do I have a, a, a motion to approve the meetings, uh, the approval of the July 7th, 2021 public work session minutes. So moved. Uh, Mr. McRoberts, a second? Second. Mrs. Cherry, uh, any discussion? Being none, all those in favor, say goodbye by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Carries unanimously. A motion to approve the July 12th, 2021 public work session minutes. Do I have a motion? to accept those. So moved. Mr. McRoberts, a second? Second. Mrs. Ward, any discussion? Being done, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Carries unanimously. And finally, the approval for the July 12th, 2021 regular meeting minutes. A motion to accept those as presented. So moved. Mrs. Cherry, a second? Second. Mr. Hemsel. Any discussion? Very well, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Carries unanimously. Uh, financial reports, uh, treasurer's report, Mr. Herbert. Thank you, Mr. President. Very well, thank you, how are you? Good. Good. 
so as you can see here in our notes, just going to go over a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, our July 31st fund balance and property with the property and state tax supported funds totaled $7,429,032. Uh, this amount does not include the CDs that we have out for investments. So we do have three and a half million in that. Uh, currently, the education fund had actual expenditures in the month of July of $1,221,031.14. And the debt service fund, uh, we had no payments due for the month of July, so there were no expenditures in that. And our operating fund had actual expenditures for the month of July of $509,375.67. Uh, we transferred uh, for the month of July from the Ed fund to the Ops fund $194,893.45. And that is keeping pace with uh, kind of our goals that we've set for ourselves uh, as far as the 13%. So uh, I'm sorry, 13.5%. If you look at the actual revenue that is total for the Ed Fund, we've to date transferred 12.99% of that. And then if you actually look at just the total state tuition support, we transferred 13.5% um, of that. And so we will continue to, to monitor that, make sure that we're staying on those targets uh, throughout the rest of the year here uh, as one of the objectives that we've set for ourselves. Uh, also just want to make reference to a couple of the charts that were included uh, in your packet for this month. Uh, so these were kind of a first wave of some things that I'm going to start uh, bringing into the, the board packet here uh, just for your general information. Uh, if as you've re reviewed through the executive summary, I tried to explain kind of what each one of these charts uh, entail and what it is that you're looking at. So uh, really, unless there are any other questions uh, that anyone might have uh, in any of those, then I would ask for the board's approval in our financial, or I'm sorry, our treasurer's report for the month. Do I have a motion to approve the treasurer's report as presented? So moved. Mrs. Ward, a second? Second. Mrs. Cherry, any questions or discussion? I'd like to say thank you. I like those graphs. It kind of breaks it down, and it's interesting to see the expenditures that way. I appreciate that. Very welcome. Could be no other. Do uh, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Carries unanimously. Uh, approval of claims, Mr. Herbert. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the approval for our claims uh, for the month of July, we had pre-written claims of 14,10681 uh, with new vouchers of 551,375.22 and 22 cents uh, for total claims for the month of July of $565,482.03. and three cents. Um, broken down in your summary, you can see some of the top uh, uh, vendors, I guess, where our money was spent towards. Uh, majority of those for the month of July going towards textbooks uh, in preparation for the upcoming school year. So uh, unless there are any other questions, I would ask for your approval of the July vouchers. Do I have a motion to approve the claims for July as presented? So moved. Mr. Hemsel, do I have a second? Second. Mr. McRoberts, any questions or discussion? Being none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Carries unanimously. And finally, approval of the payroll claims, Mr. Herbert. Thank you. And the last on the item here is just our payroll. Uh, as you can see, we had two claims in um, two claims for July 9th uh, at five hundred twenty-nine thousand nine seventy-five fifty-five, and five thousand nine hundred thirty-six dollars and twelve cents. Uh, we had our July 16th payroll of $499,304.75 and our August 4th payroll uh, just this past week of $498,658.72 uh, for a total payroll claim uh, for $1,533,871. Uh, again, you can see there's an additional one on this month kind of catching up from last month where you remember we only had one payroll claim from last month. So. That's why you see a couple extra ones on there. Uh, so unless there are any questions, I would ask for your approval of our July payroll claims. 
Do I have a motion to accept the two July 9th payroll claims, the July 16th payroll claim, and the August 4th payroll claim? So moved. Mrs. Ward, a second? Second. Mrs. Cherry, questions or discussion? Being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Carries unanimously. Moving on to old business. Mrs. Ward. Yes. So last month we talked about um, COVID protocols and um, we had a discussion about volunteers. And volunteers, um, as of today, they are required to be vaccinated. And if I remember correctly, we talked about we weren't quite sure if that's really what we wanted, but that's what other schools were doing. And I think all of us in our own mind were thinking about classroom volunteers. However, I've been contacted by some coaches and the concern that they have is that they use volunteers to carry out essential duties um, in order to have a basketball game, a volleyball match, a tennis match. Um, we have volunteer coaches. And so we haven't really distinguished um, if we're going to follow that same protocol for all volunteers. Um, and if so, how will those volunteers upload those vaccination cards? And um, I struggle with that um, protocol because um, we have some teachers who volunteer um, outside of the school day. They're allowed to not be vaccinated, to sub in our buildings, but yet then they can't volunteer and coach volleyball. So um, for another example, we have like um, a volunteer who is a high capacity volunteer who's led post-prom um, for many years. What if she's not vaccinated now? We're losing a post-prom committee person who has led it for multiple years, who's gathered volunteers, who's done all the work, but yet because we're requiring her to get vaccinated, we're losing a high capacity volunteer that fulfills a huge role for our students and for our school. So I'm really struggling with um, that. I would like to see us move away from that current um, protocol and say volunteer, all volunteers need to be vaccinated or required to wear a mask. Well, I mean, I'm fine with getting rid of all of it. To me, it doesn't make sense. I understand that if I'm a second grade teacher and um, so-and-so wants to come in and volunteer, like is offering to volunteer, then I could see maybe where we have a stipulation. But if we have essential roles that need to be covered because we can't pay people to do those things because they're not funds, whether it's in like class do like for post prom whether it's a club robotics whether it's an athletic team then we have got to figure this out so that we can keep our high capacity volunteers without forcing them to be vaccinated thank you uh, i think we'll open it up for discussion well i mean we, we talked about this, and I guess, again, in my mind, I was thinking classroom mm -hmm. volunteers, you know, that were coming in and working at the elementaries for the most part. I mean, are we talking about coaching volunteers and the, the post-prom parents and... Yeah, there's, well, there's a couple different ways to think. That's a good point. I mean, there's a couple different ways to think about it. I, I, would, I would agree. I think most of our mindset was in terms of thinking about classroom volunteers. I think particularly at elementary and middle school levels where you don't have vaccinated students in, in you know, most of those grade levels. That's, that's one consideration. But we never really did define either to say that we would have different distinctions of volunteers um, in, in some of these other capacities. Now, one... One distinction I would make is if someone is a, they're an employee of the school district, and let me take a teacher for example, that's an easy one. If I have a teacher who teaches, but they're volunteering in some other capacity, they're still an employee. They would not have to be, um, I mean, they would still be treated as an employee. So someone who is employed by the school corporation, even though they're volunteering in some other capacity for the school corporation, I think would still be considered an employee and subject to the rules on employees. 
would that be um, true for substitute teachers? Uh, it could be. I mean, those are things I mean, that, yeah, I mean, those are some of those fine-grained decisions that, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't had an opportunity to think all the way through with, right. with each situation. So, I mean, they, they could be. Because, I, I mean, we one person that, that. that I know, it, like, she's in this situation. Mm -hmm. She's a substitute teacher. She subs pretty much every time she's asked mm -hmm. to sub, and yet she volunteers to coach on the volleyball team. Right. You know, and she plays an essential role. Mm -hmm. And, I mean... There's just multiple examples of how we have those high capacity volunteers that I, I don't think we want to lose. Um, yeah, the, the challenges you have, not to say these aren't solvable challenges, but the challenges you have are there, there's, you know, last year everybody's wearing a mask. This year, possibly no one's wearing a mask, depending on what the option they employ. So if you look at a policy for volunteers that says, uh, you're either vaccinated or you wear a mask, the challenge is enforcement. Because even though they may demonstrate or have a card on file or something that they've been vaccinated, well, that person doesn't need to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. But if they're not wearing a mask or if they're not vaccinated and they're not wearing a mask, then, and maybe they should be by, by that potential mm -hmm. policy, then you're, how are you gonna know that when the person's out working you know, and doing whatever they're doing? Uh, if they should be by policy, if they should be wearing one. That, that's a challenge you run into because the, the intent here was to try to keep as many people from outside the school, not to keep them out, but that are not vaccinated from being in the school, particularly have high numbers of unvaccinated students and you know, possibly even personnel for that matter. So I not, not that, saying there isn't a, a way to solve that, mm -hmm. but those, I think those are the right. challenges that exist. That's hard because we have teachers probably in that same situation who are not vaccinated, who are not going to wear a mask, and they're with students six and a half hours a day. That's, that's you know. true. Yeah. And the distinction is your, your employees, obviously you have to have mm -hmm. the employees there. And I understand the, uh, what you're saying, too. There are certain volunteers you may feel like, hey, we, they're really right. valuable and we need to have them there as well. So how do you find a policy standpoint that, that works for, for different, different folks? Right. So I don't know if you could, you know, distinguish between, you know, your, your the, the one difference you have is once you get past sixth grade, uh, theoretically, everybody could, can, you know, that one or one could have a vaccine. But those under sixth grade and down, where you have your 11-year-olds and down, typically, um, don't have an opportunity to have a vaccine. So I think as a school corporation, part of our obligation there in terms of due diligence is to try to make sure we don't expose uh, children in the school setting uh, to people who may not have been vaccinated. I think that's, that's the challenge we're up against, probably more so than anything else. The other consideration is, um, remember, if you're outside, if you're outside only, then there's, there's no need for a mask either, uh, even by CDC uh, recommendations. If someone in a volunteer capacity where they're only outside, that, you know, a mask wouldn't be required there either. I think those are a couple of the areas I, I've thought of that, you know, might bear some, some more thought. How many um, volunteer coaches do we have that are not compensated? I, off the top of my head, I, I don't know. I mean, we can get that information. I mean, are there some that are not? They are strictly volunteer? Yeah, yes. Um, okay. You have, I don't know, you know, it might be 10 to 20, I'm guessing, total. But um, <clears throat> from a volunteer, because we have a lot of people, too, event workers and things like that. A lot of times we think as volunteers, most of those people are compensated. Uh, by the school corporation so in some of those areas. Mm -hmm. no, but. Yeah. So if you've got a parent that of a elementary school child that <clears throat> wants to bring cookies in for their birthday that day, I'm assuming maybe they still do that on on we're saying that they're they're not allowed in if the parent's not vaccinated to come into the classroom. Essentially that's what we're saying, I think. Well there there's a little distinction here. It's a good good question. We they're they're when we were thinking of volunteers, we're thinking of people who are proved to work closely with children on an ongoing basis. So your mindset, as we talked about before, might be that uh, volunteers coming into third grade maybe two or three times a week and pulling out a small group to read extra with children on an ongoing basis. Uh, I think what you're uh, referring to would be more what we put, qualify as a visitor, someone mm -hmm. just visiting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and our rule last year, we didn't allow visitors or volunteers into the buildings at all. Uh, this year we're allowing both in we wanted our volunteers under the current practice right now, our volunteers ongoing uh, to be vaccinated. The visitors don't necessarily need to be vaccinated, but they're not, we're not permitting their 
intrusion around the building um, beyond the front office this year. So they can come inside, take care of business with the front office. If you know their children forget something, want to bring it in, we're just not allowing them to, to go further into the building. Right. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. It, it's just so confused. It, just too many, a lot of moving parts. Yeah, it's confusing. It is. it is. I think it just needs to be simplified. And if, if we're going to let be optional masks for students, it ought to be optional masks for volunteers or optional vaccination, in my opinion. I'm comfortable with making it all optional. Personal choice. Everybody's been vaccinated that wants to be vaccinated by now. <clears throat> I, I think, I don't know how we do this, but we move ahead with that. I think the one consideration, because as a board, uh, you, you do have an obligation under Indiana law to make sure that you put some preventative measures in place. And the, the place that would give me the most apprehension would be at grades one through six, or K through six, pre-K through six, mm -hmm. because those children haven't had an opportunity to be vaccinated because it's not available to them. So that's just something I would want the board to, you know, think about yeah. in terms of decision making there. I understand that as a board we have an obligation, but we also took an obligation and an oath to our constitution. And I'm not trying to make this a political issue, but when it comes down to it, it ends up becoming a political issue. You know, and with the mass, I guess I get kind of soft on that because forcing somebody to put a mask on while I don't agree with it, you're not hurting or taking the potential to hurt their well-being. But when you start forcing someone to inject a substance into their body that they can no longer take away, I think we're overstepping our constitutional bounds by freedom of choice for those people. And to set a policy to where we have to mandate that people get a vaccination that they may not want to get, that people have varying views on that vaccination, I think is completely wrong as a governmental body here. You know, we were elected to represent the people, and I think it's fair to say that the majority of the people we represent, from what I've heard, they're not for these vaccinations. And we need to take that into consideration. Yes, we have an obligation to protect the kids and to protect our community. Um, but I, I think as a governmental body, and we see it across the country now, school, school boards are the biggest topic when it comes to these vaccination and mass, mm -hmm. because we affect the majority of the people. What goes on in Washington and at the state doesn't affect near as much as what our school boards do. And you see school boards across the country that are affecting parents and children's lives tremendously. I don't want to be one of those school boards that's going to do that. I believe in personal choice. I believe it's the right for a parent to make the choice with their children and to allow the parents to run their household as they see fit. Is there any value, um, I mean, we're having a conversation, uh, in extinguishing distinguishing <laughs> um, the volunteer in, in terms of if, if somebody wants to come and volunteer during the school day when they will be in close quarters with the students classroom volunteer yeah that that vaccination policy would remain and if it's an after school which would hit all your coaches the other committees and those types of things then it wouldn't be required I mean I, I, I still believe the original intent of that was for the classroom volunteers that would be in contact with the, the kids and not the coaches and those types of things. So, I mean, that'd be, that'd be one option also, or another option. On that standpoint, your activities by students are volunteer at that point as well. I mean, there's not a requirement to be in an extracurricular type of thing. So I think that makes some sense from, from that standpoint. But outside of North Elementary, do you have volunteers in the classroom? I mean, that seemed to end for our family when we hit third grade. Most of the classroom volunteers were at North Elementary. You're, you're going to have more at North and South. You're going to occasionally have some at middle school, high school during the school day. You wouldn't have a lot. Okay. Well, you think about field day. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen. They don't happen often or every week or every day. But I'm thinking it's going to be a nightmare 
for whoever is responsible for making sure when Christina Ward comes into the middle school as a volunteer, she's vaccinated. Like, I don't even know, know if we've, we've talked about the process of who's doing that, how is that happening, who's managing that. Um, so again, we're, we're taking time away from our staff that we've hired to do a job to manage COVID, which is not their job. And so I would like us to come to an agreement on one simple policy that's all volunteers, because I feel that's clear. I feel it's transparent. Um, and I feel like we can come up with something that is, you know, works for everybody. Everybody can wear, anybody can wear a mask if they want to. I think if you get in, you're going to muddy the waters if we try to distinguish too much and then this isn't fair, then I have to do this. And, you know, I just feel like it would simplify things if we could come up with one statement. I'm fairly comfortable with our adults in our community that they will make good decisions that if they're sick, they're not going to come volunteer. We're grown ups. And I don't right. think any of our volunteers are going to jeopardize getting any of our children or other adults sick to come and volunteer in their duties. So I, I think we're arguing at a move point, honestly, but with um, if it's okay with the board, we did have one person sign up to discuss, and it's kind of on the COVID-related protocol. So if you don't mind, I'm going to open up public sure. uh, right now. So, uh, Mr. Winters. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. President and the rest of the board. Um, Dr. Schaefer. First, before I start, I want to say thank you for meeting me, with me last Friday. And I've reached out to a few of you, and you've responded and had a good conversation, so I appreciate that. Um, I have prepared remarks, but I, I'm going to go off of that a little bit because, Corey, or somebody just mentioned this, you know, I think it was you, uh, Mrs. Ward. We spent the last 20 minutes discussing something that has nothing to do with educating our children. It's about things of which we are not experts. Um, and I think that, I mean, I, I'm all over the place now. Dr. Schaefer and the rest, you know, those first and second graders, they're not at high risk. It seems like we're only listening to the CDC and the Indiana Department of Health or the Hendricks County Department of Health. Why can't we look at other things? I sent you all a video today. That video was taken down by YouTube at one point because they don't want any other discussion. They want a narrative. You mentioned it's political. It's absolutely political at this point. We're going to variant, they're going to variant us until we are in total submission. And to your point, yes, this is where it happens, these local communities. So now if you'll, I'm going to read through this because I'm obviously a little hot about this, but you know, what brings me here tonight was the nugget of policy that I'm glad you're discussing, which is the, the disparity in the policy with volunteers and teachers. And Mrs. Ward, the obvious answer is that you just remove it completely. And I would go one step further, don't take away another year of my ability to go have lunch with my daughter. They're, they we're not at risk. Um, depending on what you believe in, I had COVID, so a vaccine is not going to do me any, any good at this point. And so we can't have a third year in a row. We are taking things away from our children over something that, in the scheme of things, is not as deadly as we're being told, especially at this age. Um, I do applaud the, the district for not requiring teachers. That makes a lot of sense, and it's a personal choice. But the disparity there was they still spend more time with the students than any normal, regular volunteer, by definition. So I think you should drop that completely, not, have, not require anybody uh, to have the vaccination or to prevent it or pr prove it. Um, so I strongly urge the board to change this policy to not require vaccines and or proof for those who wish to be a part of our children's education. I would also encourage the board to consider allowing lunch visits from parents with students without requiring vaccine passports to enter. As I mentioned earlier today, I sent a six and a half minute video to you, uh, the board members and Dr. Schaefer. And I, I know, I think most of you have had a chance to watch it. It was very interesting information and I'm not an expert, I'm not a virologist, but uh, he, his, what he was saying made some sense, and, and that's why I, I thought it was good. I found another video I sent to a few of you. 
Um, but he has a lot more to say, but he, he, he's making the case that we shouldn't treat vaccinated and unvaccinated differently. Um, and so I encourage you to watch that if you haven't. You know, perhaps we should have died on the mask hill last year. Not enough could see past their own fear to the slippery slope that bind, blind obedience creates. Now we are battling the creation of second-class citizens and vaccination segregation in socialist havens like New York and liberal-controlled government education centers such as Ben Davis and our lunchroom where vaccinated students must eat separate from unvaccinated students. I hope we never see that here. The inevitable end game is no proof of vax, no commerce. We have never had to show proof of other vaccines, but we are on the precipice of living in a world that would be unrecognizable to those who went before us and who fought against tyranny, paying the ultimate price. It is frightening how so easily some will trade liberty for perceived temporary safety without batting an eye, and even worse, without having a thought on the subject or doing their own research. Without a serious and swift change in direction, our country will be unrecognizable in a decade or sooner, and not for the better. It starts in local communities. It happens at the school board level. It happens with community leaders and elected officials. We are all responsible. The First Amendment defines us. The Second through the Tenth Amendment is there to make sure that that definition is not changed. In my mind, we need the 1776 spirit now like we did back then. And I hope enough wake up before it's too late. I urge the board to stand up to any further attempt by the CDC or local health departments to dictate how we educate our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winters. Yep. I know we had a few come in a little later. Is there anybody else that has any public comments that they want to give on the topic? If you would, just step up and if you could give us your name and your address, please. My name is Ed Morrell. I live at 1275 North County Road, 200 West, Danville, Indiana. Thank you. Um, this will be my first school board meeting that I've ever attended. Um, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> more importantly, I thank uh, Dr. Schaefer for discussions we've had in the past um, pertaining to this discussion, uh, this topic, and others. And um, so far, um, you know, I, I think um, you guys are on the right approach pertaining to the last video that i seen that Dr. Schaefer has put out. Um, that is that um, we're adults, um, we, can, we have a great healthcare system and we're able to mitigate our own risks in, uh, in our society and, um, and think uh, we leave it up to the parents and their children. Um, to do that. So I would like to remind um, some of you, I guess, that, you know, this vaccine, it says right in the pamphlet that it does not inoculate. And um, last week, Carnival Cruise Lines, um, with a fully vaccinated staff and a fully vaccinated, um, you know, all the uh, visitors and, and people went on there, 100% come back uh, COVID positive, okay? So this idea that if you're vaccinated, that you know, you're safe, you're good, you're not, whatever, it, it doesn't, it says it right in their own pamphlets, man, if you just read it. Um, the other thing is that there's a federal law, 21 U.S. Code 360 BBB-3, states that no emergency <clears throat> use pro, uh, product can be mandated, okay? This is all an experiment. The medicine, the mask wearing, um, all of it is an experiment. And there's federal laws that prevent the mandating of that. Uh, the Nuremberg Code says that no one <clears throat> may be coerced to participate in a medical experiment, which is what we've all done as, our, as a society, as a world, okay? So, you know, I would just point to the physics, okay? Not, they, they claim that this COVID virus hasn't even been isolated yet. There's been several uh, subpoenas out there. Nobody's been able to prevent one. Uh, they claim that it's 0 .007 micron, okay? The best mask out there, I think, is like five, okay? So the idea that this mask 
is doing anything is doing nothing but suffocating you. Um, I was once trained in um, um, confined space. We'd have to go in, we'd have to test air. And um, if you've ever taken one of these O2 sensors and stuck it in your mask, uh, you know, typical, this room, for uh, example, is uh, 20 to 21% oxygen. With that mask on, that drops to 17, okay? By OSHA, that, that is a critical limit, okay? And yet we're subjecting our kids to wear this thing all day long, okay? And we're not even beginning to touch it, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm a little emotional too. Um, the psychological aspects of this, this idea that, you know, you're too close to me or that um, I don't have a mask on so I, I can't be in the area. I, it, it's ridiculous, okay? And um, I don't even think we've seen the outcome <clears throat> of that yet, but um, anyway, what else do I have here? I appreciate your time. I concur with what Mr. Winters has said. Um, I would ask for your support in, in allowing us as responsible adults to mitigate our own lives, our children's lives. Um, your job is to provide the highest level of education to our children, not feed them, not provide safety for them, <clears throat> nothing. Educate them. That's why they're here. If you're not willing to do that, let me know, and I'll be the first one out of here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Is there anyone else? Can I yeah. Go, please go ahead. Yeah, if you just step up and give us your name and address, please. My name is Rachel Wilson, and I live at 897 Tyne Circle, Danville. Thank I you. Just, just to put a number on this, like, how many volunteers do you have in your building to help with reading and come in with math? And then, and North, the same thing. Like, that is a critical age that our kids are not going to learn how to do these simple things if we don't have volunteers. There's not enough teachers to be able to get into groups of five with these little kids, and they have to have that. Volley digs, there's what? Mm -hmm. I don't know, 20 coaches? Mm -hmm. the, the youth basketball, there's another 15. If you guys keep this for the volunteers, you're keeping parents that want to be involved in their kids' lives out of the school. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. How many parents come and sit with their little kids and take time out of their day to go eat? You know what I mean? Like, you can't, you can't do that to parents. You guys say, why are the grade levels dropping? Why aren't parents interested? And then you have parents that actually want to do it, and you're saying, you can't do that. That's all I have to say. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Sir. And again, if you just give your name and address, please. Uh, my name's Kevin Smith. I live at 126 George Court, Danville, Indiana. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, to piggyback on what has been said already, this is political, I think, in large part. Uh, the biggest part that concerns me is only one narrative is pushed. Mr. Mr. Winters pointed out that the YouTube video that you've seen, by the time you get home, it'll be taken off. You won't be able to catch it on that. You have to view it on something else. Try to find it by other means. When did we stop being able to have a debate or have a conversation that has two points or two sides? That's how we get to where we are today. We push masks, we push vaccines, Half the country might, or a third of the country might agree with that, and the others that don't, if you don't fall in line and you have to be shoved to two different lunchrooms, two different sections, I'm not that old to remember segregation, but are we not going back to that? Do we need to wear scarlet letters? If you're not vaccinated, my kids have to wear a certain color of shirt or shorts when they come to school because they're not vaccinated? Are we segregating now? What's the mental hit that our kids are going to take from that? 
Are we looking into, studying, even listening to what's the impact on their health of wearing a mask all day? And then the physical impact if they can't. I've spent 23 years in research. I'm not an industrial hygienist, but I've done plenty of that work as well. You've got to be fit tested. You've got to be medically cleared if you're going to wear a respirator. A mask isn't a respirator, but you're restricting the airflow. Then you're going to put one on a kid and tell him you can't go to gym unless you're wearing a mask. Now you're running around a gym with a mask on. What's the impact of that? Are we looking at that? You can't find it on YouTube because that narrative is shoved. We're listening to one side. There's a whole other piece, regardless of what political spectrum you're on, of what's the mental and physical impact of all the things we're pushing on these kids. And that's not your role, right? We want you guys to educate our kids. Like Mr. Morrell said, we'll take care of their health, their well-being. We'll take the education that you guys give them as a piece of shaping them to be adults, and we'll do the rest. Not just us as parents, but us as a community. I'll help Ed with his. He'll help me with mine, right? And as a community, we'll shape young kids to be adults at some point, sitting in the chairs you're sitting in, doing the same thing for their, the next generation, right? It's not one-sided. We can make a decision in a boardroom to put a mask on them or vaccinate them, and you're, maybe you've absolved yourself of some risk, but the whole other side of the mental health and the physical health of those actions have to be fully studied before we can make that decision, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let me just add one more thing. Um, to date, excuse me. Um, to date, my understanding is that chicken chicken pox today still is far more deadly to not only um, children but also adults than COVID has led us to believe. Uh, our specialists. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, if we're able to um, endure that, I, I think we're quite comp you know, capable of enduring um, this COVID thing. Um, secondly, is I do have friends in the, in the medical industry. I talk to them often. What are you seeing? Um, and and the, the, the number one response is bacterial pneumonia from wearing the mask, okay? They're making it, you know, super susceptible to other, it's almost predisposing them to other respiratory il illnesses and that sort of thing, okay? So, you know, you're not having a proper air exchange. You're forcing these kids and, uh, to rebreathe their bodily waste is what it is. Um, and that, that, that waste is then incubating in the lungs. And by the time they recognize that something's wrong, you know, we're, now, we're, now we're, we're pushing antibiotics, we're, we're hospitalized, we're all these things, okay? Um, you know, I have, have uh, other friends and family that um, have uh, severe der uh, der dermatitis. They have dermatitis on their face now and being treated for that because of this mask wearing. Um, another one they claim that has developed uh, asthma as a result of this mask wearing. Um, you know, to me it's clear to see. Um, this is clearly, you know, if you look at the winners and losers here, it's clearly a political driven. I'm not sure of the term I want to use there. But anyway, um, I, would, I would ask you to consider the real ideas there that um, um, these kids are being injured physically and mentally and otherwise as a result of this mask wearing. Um, I would like you to continue. Um, I know we got, sounds like you know, a lot of support in letting us mitigate that, that risk on our own as parents. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I haven't heard anybody say, Stay healthier, you know, eat, eat more vitamins, you know, or anything like that. It's, no, stay home, be inactive, stay away from people, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I don't think that's a call. Um, I, I'd, I'd go back to the kindergarten days when let's wash our hands and keep our hands clean. I think that's where a lot of, you know, germ spread. I think that, that is, uh, you, know, you know, in my mind, uh, maybe the best thing we could do, um, you know. And... Um, he said, if, you know, I have no problem. My, my, my children 
don't feel well, let's keep them home. You know, why, why force them in? You know, this last year, um, there, were, there were probably, you know, days that I would have just said, my, my children uh, suffer some uh, typical migraines once in a while. And, um, you know, under, under the policy you guys had last year, that if any, um, you know, any, any dismissal um, as a result of a headache or anything else resulted in a 10 or 14 day school suspension um, over, you know, over what we know is a headache. You know, you've taken that opportunity right out of our hands and you forced us to send our kid to school and endure for fear of number one being isolation, you know, and now you pointed out as, oh, this kid might have, you know, and it looks like, you know, the degree of symptoms, I mean, I think I, I endure those almost every day and, um, normally. So, I, you know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I, I guess I would ask you just to uh, side with the parents, trust the parents. Um, we know what we're doing. We know what our kids need. Um, you know, if, if, if things ain't going well, we got a great health care system. we got great doctors in the area. we got a great hospital. Um, and we'll take the appropriate action, you know. Stay, stay focused on the education aspect of things, and I think we'll, we'll do fine as a, a community. So that's all I have. Thank you again. Thank you. Is there anyone else wanting to say anything? Okay. I appreciate all of you that did speak, that kept it respectful and at tone. We all know that this is an emotional topic. Uh, we've seen other school board meetings where parents have gotten um, hateful and out of hand. Appreciate all of you kept it at respectful and, and as a discussion. Uh, that really that really says a lot about our community and our parents and our community. So thank you very much. I appreciate everything that you guys said. If there's people that want to talk on another topic, we'll have that towards the end of the, the meeting. So. Anything from the board members? So, or uh, what action we want to take? Yeah, I'm, I. Do you want me to make a motion to, to, to go for? Well, that we're not gonna mandate. I was gonna say, let's let's know exactly what we're talking yeah, about here. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, there's a lot of conversation about masks. I mean, currently we are not requiring masks. This is about uh, volunteers. You know, yeah, yeah. This what is, we are discussing. Thing is the policy in regard to volunteers, volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, what is your suggestion dr. Schaefer <laughs> well I, I gave you my suggestions um, the and, and to, the, to the point that Sarah we weren't able to define everything so we probably need to further define so um, I Again, I think you're trying to you're trying to balance a lot of things because it, when when people come in, we have to remember they're not exposed just to their children; they're exposed to all children uh, in the setting. So, um, I I think when you look at it practically and functionally, and, and uh, Mrs. Wart made some really good points about you know trying to um, I'll, I'll say staff, if you will, uh, from a volunteer standpoint, some of these extracurricular activities. I think that's where a lot of the greater need is actually. Um, you know, if you looked at outside the day versus in, you know, during the school day, I mean, I think that that's a, an easy place to, uh, you know, make a difference. Um, so if I think you have an option, you could require vaccines uh, for your volunteers. That's where we've been, but limited to the school day and not required outside the school day. Uh, if you're not going to do that, then you may want to consider, um, I think that would be the cleanest. Um, but if you don't want to require vaccines, then you have some other options. You could not allow uh, volunteers in. Um, you could limit it to the elementary schools where you don't have vaccinated students. Uh, you could uh, require that the volunteers wear a mask, whether they're vaccinated or not. Uh, or another option is you could just say no, no masks or no vaccines for anybody. I just think when you do that, I think you inherently have some risks there. And I don't mean just for the school corporation, I mean for the kids in the classrooms, uh, particularly because those kids are gonna be up to 11 years old. Our vaccination rate for the county, and this is everybody 12 and older, is about, it, it's well over 60%. It's probably closer to 70% uh, 
of those that are vaccinated adults or 12 and older in the county. But you have zero um, vaccination uh, for 11 and under. And that, that's where my biggest concern is. I guess that would be up to their, the parents then if they, after they saw that new, if we, if we did away with vaccine, making volunteers be vaccinated, then it would be the parents' choice on how they went when it moved forward. Is that's putting the choice back into the people's, letting them make the decision, not, not us mandating stuff. As to whether or not their kid would work with the volunteer, or I, well, yeah, you're not saying that, that, then like they're not going to send them to, they, well, maybe they don't send them to the school if the volunteers aren't, aren't vaccinated, which I highly, I find that won't even be the case. <clears throat> is there value in surveying our constituents about this? I know we did that when we went from six feet to three feet and we kind of went against the grain. Um, I don't know if it's a simple, you know, questions like, you know, do you, how comfortable on a scale of one to 10 do you feel or, you know, creating some kind of survey um, for our constituents to get their input. Um, Cause, but we're gonna have people on all different sides or is it just, right. let's let the volunteers make a personal choice. I don't, and I don't like the idea of telling a volunteer they have to be vaccinated. I don't and either. We've had that discussion. Right. Um, and I guess in a lot of the reading I've done, you know, if you're transmitting COVID, it's not necessarily the unvaccinated that are sharing that, it's even the vaccinated. So, and it's kind of hard for me if you're in a classroom with a teacher maybe who, and a volunteer and 25 kids, how do you know where that came from? So. Same as the stomach bug, strep yeah. throat, the flu, lice. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of. Well, and we've talked all along, even with our current policy on the masks, you know, they're recommended, but they're not required. You know, we have said all along that at any point, mm -hmm. we might have to go back and adjust that. I right. mean, if mm -hmm. the county breaks out crazy and, um, or our school. you know, so I guess my point is no policy that we said is in stone and can't be reviewed mm -hmm. or reversed. looked at again. Um, if the data shows it needs to be. Yeah. So, I right. mean, I want to see a little, it, not it, to interrupt you, Tim, but you brought back, well, we're going to bring back, we might have to make masks mandatory again. Well, I'm going to have to have some science that shows me that I'm just saying, mask. Mm -hmm. my, my point or, here, I guess is what I'm saying is if we decided tonight that we are not going to require um, volunteers to be vaccinated, and then in the first month of school, we have crazy outbreaks or something, we can always go back and say, okay, no visitors or no volunteers unless they're wearing a mask or, I mean, mm -hmm. we're not bound for mm -hmm. the school year. You see what I'm saying? That's the point yeah. I'm making. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, uh, we can change those policies. It's, we learned, if anything else, through COVID, it's day to day, right? I mean, right. there's there's different uh, things coming at us every, every day, every week, so. Um, I don't think we have to feel the weight of the world that no, we, we can't redo anything because we can um, or undo anything. So, so board, what would you like to do? <laughs> I'll entertain a motion. You'll entertain while there's a motion? No, I'll entertain a motion. <laughs> not, no, let's not get emotional. So my motion would be to, to not make it mandatory for volunteers to be vaccinated at this point right now. Okay. I would agree. Second? Second. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor by Mr. Hemsel to not make vaccinations mandated yeah. for our volunteers, period. Is that correct? Period. And seconded by Mrs. Ward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more discussion on the topic? So all that motion does is just clarify we're not going to have our 
require our volunteers to be vaccinated, but it hasn't even touched on. Do they wear a mask or not? Is that a personal preference? Our mask That's policy's choice. already set. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's already optional. Okay. And with that, it's recommended. It will continue yeah. to be, mm -hmm. yeah, recommended, recommended. But, but not optional. Required. Okay. Yeah. Any further? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Carries unanimously. Moving on to new business, uh, consider approval of personnel recommendations. Dr. Schaefer. Yeah, um, personnel report is before you. I um, would like to just point out, uh, and all the, all the names are in your report, but since we, we pushed the agenda out, we it did add three names to the report who were uh, Sarah Reed, Sarah Alford Judd, and Veronica Brummett. They're all in your packet of information. Just wanted to point out to you those names have been added to the to the advertised uh, report. So. Okay. So I'd recommend uh, approval of the report as submitted. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel recommendations as submitted? So moved. Mrs. Cherry, do I have a second? Second. Mrs. Ward, uh, discussion questions? Being done, all those in favor say goodbye by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Carries unanimously. Additional appropriation hearing for general obligation bond, Dr. Schaefer. Yeah, just let my computer catch up here a little bit. There we go. Um, last month, uh, the board heard from our financial advisors with Baker Tilly uh, on the intended purpose and uh, financial impact uh, of this general obligation that the, the board is considering. Um, the project purpose uh, for the bond will be to provide for various small projects across the district. Uh, including technology and transportation. Uh, the scope that we heard about of the actual bond will be around a million dollars. That will be paid back in a year without raising the tax rate. Um, we will advertise, uh, for the purpose of advertisement, we will advertise a very conservatively higher maximum rate of 2.5 million, uh, but again, expect to only see about a million dollars of proceeds uh, from Either that, I'm really losing my voice. One or the, other. <laughs> uh, the board also passed a preliminary bond. Thanks, Bill. Um, preliminary bond resolution at the last meeting. So tonight, uh, we will begin by holding a hearing on the additional appropriation needed to authorize expenditure of the bond proceeds. In other words, tonight's hearing is not about the, the, the projects or buying buses or, or buying or paying for technology. It's simply the board in this process of, of approving a resolution, which you'll do here later, um, is just authorizing us to spend those proceeds that are, that are realized from the bond when that sale happens later this fall. Um, so the board will then act on the recommendation to approve uh, the additional appropriation resolution. And then the final determination resolution will also then be acted on. So first, the additional appropriation hearing. So, Mr. President, uh, would you like to open the floor at this time, subject to, uh, I think our policy is a three-minute limit per person that would want to speak on the yes, additional sir. appropriation? Yes, sir. At this time, we'll open uh, the public hearing. If anyone wishes to speak, please step to the podium with your name and address, and you will be uh, entitled to speak for three minutes. Okay. I don't believe we're going to have anybody that wants to speak. So we'll close, close the floor. Okay. <laughs> we will close the public hearing. And then item C. make a motion. Item, we'll, we'll just move right on to item C then. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so moving along, we will... Now up is the consider approval for additional appropriation resolution, Dr. Schaefer. Yeah, again, just immediately following the hearing, uh, the school board must approve the appropriation of the bond proceeds to be spent on the project cost before any bond money can be expended. Uh, unlike appropriation of tax dollars, 
Uh, this additional appropriation of bond proceeds is not required to be approved by the Department of Local Government Finance as we typically go through in a, in a budget uh, process. Uh, we now request the board's approval of the additional appropriation resolution, and that resolution was, was in your packet. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the additional appropriation resolution as presented? So moved. Mr. McRoberts, do I have a second? Second. Mrs. Cherry. Are there any questions, comments, or discussion? Okay, being done, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Carries unanimously. Moving along, uh, consider approval of final bond resolution, Dr. Schaefer. Yeah, the, the final bond resolution establishes the amount to be borrowed, uh, a maximum term of repayment, and the maximum interest rate it also contains the details about the bonds, such as the form of the bond. And if you, if you notice reading through that resolution, it is much longer than the uh, additional appropriation resolution. Uh, the resolution also authorizes the publication of the notice of sale of the bonds when it, when it comes time for the bond sale. And it establishes the maximum cost an underwriter or banker may bid for the bonds. Uh, it also establishes a bid committee who will award the bonds to the lowest bidder. Um, so this resolution approves the form of the third supplement to the master continuing disclosure undertaking uh, and the registrar and paying agent agreement. Uh, you, the board, uh, upon passage, will not need to sign those tonight. They'll be signed upon the bond sale. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission requires that school corporation enter into that master continuing disclosure undertaking before it issues bonds. That's why it is there and part of the resolution. Uh, so the corporation has entered this type of agreement previously. And um, it requires the corporation to agree to annually provide certain types of financial information uh, to the SEC, uh, to the EMMA database, and provide notice of certain material events on a timely basis. It, it, it keeps, keeps everybody uh, according to Hoyle, as they say, in terms of the bond issuance. So, uh, so tonight, upon passage of the final uh, bond resolution, uh, you will be asked following the meeting to sign the additional appropriation resolution, which you just approved. Uh, to sign this resolution, which you're about to act on, uh, sign excerpts of the minutes from the meeting, uh, and sign the, the deemed final certification. It will be those four documents for you to sign after the meeting tonight. All that language is included in this approval. So would ask the board's approval of the uh, final uh, bond resolution. Okay. Do I have a motion for approval of the final bond resolution as submitted? So moved. Mr. Hempsel, do I have a second? Second. Mrs. Ward, any questions, comments, or discussion? Being none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Carries unanimously. Okay, moving along. School board policy update, Dr. Schaefer. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are two policies we're recommending for updating. Um, so it'll be a first reading, I'm asking on both of these, I'm not asking for approval tonight on either one. Um, they are on social networking, which is an existing policy, and on electronic participation by board members in board meetings, which is a new policy recommendation from the Indiana School Board Association, and I believe it is also a requirement statewide that you establish a policy on this. This came out of the, the recent uh, legislature uh, and their actions. Um, so I'm going to begin with uh, school board policy 0167.6. This would be the, the number of the new policy. Um, now, if you had a chance to read through that, you're going to see that there's a recommendation of uh, how many days notice that if, if a board member was going to participate in a uh, public meeting through virtual means uh, online, uh, this policy establishes limits for that that are required by law. Uh, the one thing that it doesn't establish is how much notice are you going to give to myself and uh, Aaron and Bill <laughs> to set up the technology. Um, I would recommend at least a minimum of three days. Um, so if you could let us know on a Friday that, hey, if we have a Monday meeting, uh, we can get that set up. So that's, that's the first piece in there that needs to be addressed. There's just kind of a blank in there. We can fill in how many days. I would recommend three um, uh, let's see what else. The statute limits the number of board members who can participate online in a meeting to less than a majority. So if we're having a meeting, two, two max, that's established by law, only two maximum can participate online under non-emergency uh, situations. Uh, 
Uh, electronic meetings are also limited to fewer than 50% of all meetings. Um, and a member cannot attend virtually for more than two consecutive meetings. So these are some limits established uh, in the statute. Um, there are a few other exclusions in the policy as well. So if you're in military duty and could only attend as a result of that, then there's some exclusions around those limits and those are listed in the policy. I didn't, you can also add in other limits if you want additional limits. Uh, I did not include those uh, because I think they just further limit your flexibility as a board. Uh, but you could include or impose on yourself more limits if you wanted to. Um, so because the boards, um, you're able to do that. Uh, so again, for first read, I, I've not tried to write in any additional limits. If you want them, you know, please let me know. We can we can bring those back. So that's a first reading. I don't know if you had any questions on that particular policy. I do have a question, if I may. Sure. Uh, mostly for Bill. How long does it take you to get the technology set up? If one of us or how long? Or is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, I mean, it'd be nice to have a half a day at least. Get it going. Okay. Half a day. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking instead of three days, because you mentioned Friday, mm -hmm. we don't want them coming in working on the weekend. Mondays could be, I'm sure, hectic. Mm -hmm. If we specify that on the Thursday prior to the meeting, that way they have Friday and then yeah, Monday. Great. Just, I think that's a little more gratuitous than, than yeah. getting things set up to give them Friday and then if they need to Monday. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I think three days at a minimum would be nice because and, and, and Bill's been very gracious. But sometimes, if we have staffing here and um, if things work, <laughs> yeah, because sometimes technology just doesn't behave the way you want it to. Sure. But, so any additional time the board can grant would be appreciated. I would even be okay with by the end of Wednesday to give them Thursday, mm -hmm. Friday that week to get it set up, and then Monday is the but, last kind of trial run. What do you think, Bill? I mean, this is going to affect you the most. Yeah. I mean, I which one? Thursday? Because you know board members will wait till the last minute, so it could be Some Thursday, you know, at 8 o'clock at night, sending an email to the superintendent, you're just going to have Friday and, and then Monday, so. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I was leaving a little bit on him. I'm going to make it work irregardless of what you tell me. But I'm asking you, how much time would you like? <laughs> this is your, this is your opportunity. Yeah. So yeah. you... If we did it by Wednesday evening and then give you Thursday, Friday, and then yep. Monday? That's okay. More than I've had in the past, so yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just don't know, in terms of board members, how much time you always have to know if something goes yeah. awry. Yeah, well, I mean, I think in anything, we got to have a, a little bit of give on both sides. Mm -hmm. And that's, so that's if reasonable. there's something emergent that comes up, you know, last minute, is yeah. we can all have, I mean, I think mm -hmm. there needs to be understanding on both sure. sides, but. If all practical, I think if we could, you know, by Wednesday mm -hmm. evening. So our goal would be four business days. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Or three. Three, three business, business, three days. business days. Yeah, yeah. Three three actual business days. Sure. Yeah, that works. I just to try to mm -hmm. accommodate our IT people that. So it was three. Anyway. We just need to put the word business. Business. In there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Sorry. If anybody else has anything. Well, I think we got it. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, any any other questions on on that policy? Okay, great. Um, school board policy 3400, which is also policy 4400, is both for certified and and classified staff. That is an existing policy, and what I'm recommending uh, is language to further limit how texting may be used by teachers, coaches, and extracurricular sponsors. Um, currently, only these types of employees may do any texting with any student. That's in the, in the policy as it is right now. Based on recent experiences, uh, it's probably wise to further limit that, uh, not, to, not to limit to zero, uh, I don't think. But um, I believe we should add language to require any texting that's done that be done as a group text and only in an emergent situation. Uh, we have Parent Square for anything that happens in advance that uh, Coaches and ECA sponsors and teachers can use Parent Square to communicate, which runs through our school systems. And we have a record of those communications and conversations. But I also understand, I've, I've taught, coached, done all those things. Emergent situations may come up, um, and texting may be a necessity to get a hold of, of someone. What we would want to see happen in that situation is rather than a sponsor, a coach, teacher, 
just directly texting an individual student is that they be required to also include someone else on that text, preferably an assistant coach, another teacher, at least another member of the team or the parent or someone uh, in that communication. Uh, we think we would add safety and security for all involved. Um, and then again, limit that to just emergent situations. So the, the language drafted in there uh, in red uh, is uh, to indicate that. Again, don't need a decision on that tonight. You know, please think about that, and we'll bring that back then at the next meeting for further consideration. Right now, do all coaches use the same form of communication? I mean, are they all using Parent Square? They they, they should be using Parent Square. So that's our preferred football coach and basketball coach aren't using different. Are we requiring them to use the same yes. type of communication? Yes, okay. or either either they're to go through Parent Square. Uh, there is by policy. Again, there's a little bit of room there for some texting right now, but I think we, we need to close that up a little little more securely. Again, I don't want to necessarily totally limit it, and we, we paint people in a bad corner, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, I think we want to make sure there's safety and transparency in those text communications uh, from sponsors to kids and vice versa. Do our coaches who are not employees, like as a teacher or administrator, do they have access to Parent Square? I don't know that they would all have accounts. They do. They do. They do, they do. They do okay. now. Volunteer okay. coaches do not, mm -hmm. but any paid coach has a BMO email address and okay. you can email Okay. That's good. I know my kids, their coaches have used GroupMe and created that in the past, um, but I didn't know they're moving to Parent Square only. Yeah, we, we moved there a year ago because uh, we had people using Remind and a lot mm -hmm. of different uh, right. applications, and we said we're going to go with one uh, universal application. I do know there's been a little bit of, um, and it's just with the volunteers, but I know some of those people didn't have accounts. We, we've improved that process okay. over the last year. Again, uh, just like that, there's you get an emergent situation. Um, we just want to make sure that those things are done properly and, and don't leave anything to question. How do we train our coaches um, on these new policies and procedures? Is it just through an email or? They've already been trained okay. with the fall, or I'm sorry, with the head coaches meeting in July. Um, and they were also trained with the head coaches meeting in July of last year. Okay. Well. Thank you. I guess to piggyback off that, if a change like this comes out, how do you let them all know? How are they retrained they on this? Know that Very good. Thank you. But I don't think we should rule out the chance of, hey, the bus is <clears throat> game time changed, or hey, the bus is going to leave a half an hour early. Let's get that message out in a big group email, tag, what? They, they Nobody have, ought to be disciplined for something like that. They have, uh, they all have groups set up, mm -hmm. and that actually is probably parents where they have the app on their phone. It probably is the fastest way for them to yeah. do it. That comes to the parent, though, right? And the students, students will get mm -hmm. those two. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they can text through Parent Square. Basically, they can message back okay. and forth. They mm -hmm. can do direct messaging back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's been times like ten, like it starts raining, mm -hmm. fifteen minutes before they're supposed to be at the courts, and Birdsall sends a Parent Square, and you know it's raining, courts are closed, and it comes instantly to. Our, I think schools. our athletic director ought to be. Every single <laughs> test. I think that's the third party. Every, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Every single sport, every single team. She is. She is. Probably at least feels like she is. <laughs> so this change in policy, is this giving them permission to text from their personal phone to someone else's personal phone? This, this would, right now, from a policy standpoint, teachers, certified teachers, your ECA sponsors and your coaches, by policy right now, do have the ability to text a student. Okay. Okay, outside of Parent Square. Now, uh, I know Mrs. Harvey has set a little higher expectation for, for the coaches, and that's fine. Uh, again, we're trying to promote student safety and transparency and safety of the adults, too, um, when, you, when you look at it from their perspective. So what we're trying to do is tighten, as you mentioned, if, if it's my phone, I'm sending a text. Um, we want to tighten it up just a little bit, saying if you've if you got an emergent situation and you need to get hold of a student, um, for those three groups, you can still do that, 
but you need to include somebody else on that text. Text their parent, text your assistant coach, text the athletic director, put somebody else on that uh, text so that there are more eyes on that other than okay. just the sponsor and the student. Mm -hmm. But that would be technically in a emergency last minute communication. We're That's trying to not text at all. Correct. That's okay. what they, That's we would include. It'd be an emergency okay. situation as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emails are emails are acceptable. Again, email and ParentSquare run through our school system, so we have a record of those communications. Okay. It's your cell phone or some other outside group. That's what we're trying to limit because okay. we don't have record of those conversations. Does this policy cover for the volunteer coaches too? Yes. Right now. Okay. So they. Well, they actually volunteer coaches should not be communicating as a group. I mean, to a group. We don't. But um, by. By policy, we don't typically put volunteers in charge of students because they're not employed with the school district. Um, and we don't want them being a, a primary communicator. Um, and they're not, by policy now, they're not to be texting students. Okay. They would typically, they, I can't think of a situation where a volunteer coach would be doing that. Um, but for the most part, they communicate that to the head coach and then the head coach. Okay. <laughs> so again just a first read on both both policies here this evening and let you think about those we'll bring them back that's what we have yoder for <laughs> <laughs> okay any other questions all right moving along um we are to the consider approval of the teacher appreciation grant policy dr schaefer Yes, uh, the Indiana legislature requires that each school corporation uh, in each biennium uh, approve, or in this case, reapprove uh, the teacher appreciation grant policy. Um, I, I will tell you that this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me uh, when the law hasn't changed and nothing else has changed, but we are obligated to, to follow the law. We're at the start of the, uh, the next biennium, so there's been no changes to the policy, no discussion to change the policy, no requirement to change the policy. So I'm asking the board to reapprove the policy you've already approved, just as it is. All right. So moved. Second. Awesome. <laughs> Got a motion by Mr. McRoberts, second by Mrs. Ward. Any questions or comments? Being done. All those in favor, say by, by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. <laughs> Carries unanimously. I did it. I said I, I told my staff I wouldn't use the word stupid in making that recommendation. So. <laughs> <laughs> Are you brought up? Okay. Okay, school board policy review, Dr. Schaefer. Yes, and this is just part of our ongoing review of the board policies. Uh, specifically tonight, um, we just had you take a look at uh, board policy 2105 through 2220. Um, there's nothing formally we need to do here other than just bringing those to your attention, take a look through, you know, if you've had a chance and, and say, hey, you know, something there doesn't look right or we need to change a policy, then, you know, let me know. But this is more just to familiarize yourselves with, with what those policies are. Any questions or comments? Okay, being none. Consider approval of the 2020-2021 non-resident transfer students, Dr. Schaefer. Yes, and uh, I sent you those numbers and the names. Um, we need to approve uh, these young folks uh, for officially uh, for enrollment here in the district. And uh, numbers popped up a little bit this year uh, to 209. Uh, now, two years ago, we were at 189. We, we kind of stair-stepped a little bit, but the stair-steps keep generally heading up, and, and that's what our demographic study in 2019 told us that, that would happen. So I think we were at 148, and then went to 189, and then back down to 157, now up to 209. Um, so and that trend it will probably continue, and I think something at this point we're going to begin to look at, particularly if in-resident enrollment begins to pick up over time, uh, we may uh, begin to uh, have earlier notification of transfer requests. Right now, our notification timeline is August 1st. We may move that up to perhaps sometime in June, for example. 
uh, and then limit uh, further how many transfers per uh, class that we would take. Uh, those are just some thoughts for the future as those numbers continue to, to build a little bit. Um, but other than that, I would ask the board's approval uh, of the transfer list as submitted for, for these folks getting ready to start school this week. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the 2020-2021 non-resident transfer list as submitted? So moved. Mrs. Ward, a second? Second. Mrs. Cherry, uh, any questions, comments, or discussion? Um, <clears throat> A silly question but in, in the past I, I know sometimes we've gotten these and it tells us <clears throat> excuse me what school district the kids are coming from can we get a, can we, get we will a copy get that, that to you we, at, at the time of publication we didn't have that uh, we will get it for you because okay. I like I, just, to, I like to look at those too yeah I yes. like to see where they're coming yeah. from so. good question thank you <laughs> anything else okay, being done all those in favor say bye by saying aye. aye aye any opposed nay carries unanimously consider approval of adult meal prices uh, mr herbert uh, okay so a couple of board meetings ago per the doe there was a recommendation and approval um, for the current lunch prices since that time uh, we have received some updated prices from the doe in, in regards to adult meals and so the approval before you is just to reflect those updated prices. Um, the actual breakfast price went down slightly and the lunch price went up a little bit. So uh, the breakfast price would be $2.46.25. So how we do that, we'll figure that out Is later. Is that a I bit? Guess. Isn't a bit a 0.25? <laughs> It is. It's two bits, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and then the lunch price would be four dollars and sixty cents. So again, these are these are prices that are provided from the DOE. So we just need for the board's approval of those. Do I have a motion to approve the adult meal prices as submitted? So moved, Mr. Hemsel. Second. Second, Mr. McRoberts. Any questions, comments, discussion? Being done. All those in favor, say goodbye by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Carries unanimously. Uh, superintendent report, Dr. Schaefer. Yeah, just a, a couple things tonight, more for awareness than anything. And, and the first one we actually talked about, um, a couple of members of the board would remember, we talked about this over a year ago uh, installation of crosswalk beacons around school property. And what we're looking at, and we've been working with the town on, is to uh, install uh, flashing beacons, um, like crosswalk beacons with uh, yellow amber strobes on them, uh, to put a pair at uh, Mill and Mackey, uh, to put a set of those uh, at the head of the new uh, walkway to come, uh, where you would cross over from the sidewalk on the south side at South Elementary. Uh, over to by where the transportation building is and that that new walkway once built will run down the east side of, of the South Warrior Way Drive put a uh, set of those there and then put a set down in front of the middle school there where the, the median is where the kids cross over from Clear Creek and we've in the agreement we're looking at we've and verbally we've agreed to share costs on that installation and, and maintenance of those um, we're just working out the final contract details uh, I did have Mr. Kessinger also review the, the concepts of the contract. And so what should be happening at this point is uh, the street department staff will be working that through with, uh, with uh, town authorities and, and legal counsel and bring that back. So uh, we're just kind of getting to that point to get the contract finalized. And then, and then after that, then, of course, the uh, uh, beacons would be installed. And that, that'll add a, a lot of visibility because those are bright. They're also solar powered, so they're not using energy. Uh, you know, from any other source other than the sun, uh, which will help, you know, maintenance-wise, they should be relatively maintenance-free for us for a long period of time. So, again, just a kind of an update on that. Uh, and then on collective bargaining, uh, we are entering collective bargaining season. Uh, just before the meeting tonight, we held the required state-required uh, pre-bargaining public hearing. Uh, we had no comments shared at that. Uh, so what we're now doing is looking for our first um, informal bargaining date. Uh, formal bargaining runs from September 15th through November 15th. And for all practical purposes, we have to be done by November 1st because of all the other procedural things that have to occur in that final two weeks. Um, so uh, I would ask you, and talking with uh, uh, Logan Inman, who is the DLTA chair, 
Uh, we'd like to look at uh, August 18th, which is a Wednesday, um, to, for our first informal bargaining meeting. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Corey Mason and Tim McRoberts uh, set in on those sessions uh, last year. Uh, we'd invite the board if you'd like to do that. Again, we are limited to two board members uh, due to open door uh, requirements. Uh, but if you'd like to, you're more than welcome. And so you may want to think about who you would like to, mm -hmm. to have sit on those if you'd like to continue to do that. And it's probably at that meeting on the 18th with the bargaining team then we'll think about future dates. Uh, I will tell you it's typical for us to do a couple of informal dates in late August, early September. Once we hit the September 15th formal date, you know, hopefully, um, if things progress like they typically do, we might have another couple meetings to, to get things uh, finalized. Hope to be done by the early part of October uh, with bargaining. Uh, the process then, is still, it's been for the last three years, is you then, once a tentative agreement is reached, we have to publish that on our website. Uh, we have to uh, hold a meeting uh, after that uh, at which we review in public uh, the tenets of the tentative agreement with the association. And then we have to have another 72 hour plus period following that where we advertise then in a public meeting where the board would approve uh, ratification of that agreement. So it's a multi-step process. That's why you really need to be done with the bargaining part, at least by November 1st, to give yourself enough time to hold those uh, successive meetings, to write the contract language, have it reviewed by council, and get it submitted um, to ERB uh, all in that timeline. Again, we've not had any issues with that in the last several years. Uh, bargainings went very well, uh, but just kind of laying that timeline out for you and awareness and get a chance to think about that. But we're looking at the 18th, but would probably start around 5 o'clock, maybe 4.30, um, for an informal bargaining session. That's, that's all I have, Mr. President, and thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now we come to the comedy hour. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Vice President... Could you tell us what's Well, it's going not going to make you laugh, but I don't have a report tonight, so. Well, <laughs> all gone. All right, thank Start you. Start up in September here. All right. Uh, do we have any other community input for tonight? I'd like to say, um, what's worth the uh, Parent Square messaging system? That yeah, good. Right. I do feel like I'm informed, um, even when it is, seems to be of an urgent nature or short, short notice type thing. Um, yeah, it's good. That's here a lot of good, but that seems to be effective. Uh, at least I feel. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, again, I think on behalf of the board, thank you all for showing up tonight and, and giving your input. We actually do like it when our constituents show up mm -hmm. and keep us uh, on top of things, and we have to answer to you. Uh, it makes for pretty boring meetings when it's just us. We could do a pretty good job of arguing amongst ourselves. Uh, we can always find something to get on one another about, uh, but we do appreciate and enjoy it when our community members show up. So, you know, it's your school corporation, whether you have kids in it or not, you're paying taxes into it, um, and we do enjoy when we see our community members out in the audience and they come and put input into it. It's all important to all of us. So thank you again for showing up. Can I ask a question? Absolutely, sir. In regard to uh, our policy change here, I would assume there'll be some communication sent out from the central office. There will be. I think the, the most efficient way to do it is through uh, Parent Square and send a message out to, to update specifically on that item, and we'll push that out tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Unless you would like to make a video. Nope, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Our next meeting will be September 13th at 6.30 here in the district training room. Um, and if you need any disabled accommodations made, contact the secretary to the superintendent, Mrs. Smith, and we will see that that gets done. Are there any other announcements? I don't believe so. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Mrs. Cherry, a second. Second. Mrs. Ward. You want to talk about it? No. <laughs> All those in favor signify by 